Zechariah chapter 4. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I see, and behold, a lampstand all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and its seven lamps thereon, seven lamps and seven pipes to the lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees beside it, one on the right of the bowl, and the other on the left of it. And I answered and spoke to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these are? And I said, No, my lord. And he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of Jehovah unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith Jehovah of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou dost become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone with shoutings, Grace, grace unto it. And the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall finish it. And thou shalt know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me unto you. For who has despised the day of small things? Yea, they shall rejoice, even those seven, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of Jehovah which run to and fro in the whole earth. And I answered and said unto him, what are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? And I answered the second time and said unto him, What are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden tubes that empty the gold out of themselves? And he spoke to me, saying, Knowest thou not what these are? And I said, No, my lord. And he said, These are the two sons of oil that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. So far the reading of the scriptures. This passage, which is perhaps obscure to some of us, has a very important meaning for us today. And I recall to you that when we study a book like this, we like to refer to the meaning as it was in historical context. We like to look also ahead of us to see the prophetic line. We like to make the application, spiritual lessons for us today, application. And we like to see something of the Lord Jesus, as we have expressed in our hymn, that through this we may <coughs> represent him more and more. And this is one of the key themes, really, in chapter 3 and 4, that the Lord Jesus wanted to have his representatives in a scene that looked very gloomy. And so it is for us today, in a scene that looks somber and dark and gloomy, the Lord wants us today to be his representatives. We have seen the whole context of the book is in connection with the rebuilding of the temple, the second temple, and <clears throat> that uh, rebuilding had started with uh, energy, with really with zeal in Ezra 3, and then through the opposition of the enemy it had uh, stopped. We have noticed that also when we studied the book of Haggai. And now the last time we have seen that in chapter 3, the Lord speaks not only about the house, he also is concerned about those who are in charge, like the high priest was really in charge of the house. And so he needed to be in the right condition. And in chapter 4, we see then also the governor, because Zerubbabel was the governor, and both represent two lines that we find in scripture. And I mentioned it already now, we'll go back to that. It is the priestly line and the royal line. And now when we apply it to us, you understand, we today, we are priests and kings. Uh, it's true, Zerubbabel was a king without city, without throne, without uh, kingdom, but he was a governor, he represented there this Persian emperor, but as a descendant of Solomon, he was really, uh, in essence, a king. And today we are priests and kings because of our link with the Lord Jesus. First Peter 2 explains it, Revelation 1 calls us priests and kings because of the link we have with him. So keep that in mind, and you see that chapter 3, speaking about the priest and uh, the right uh, priestly condition. Chapter 4, speaking about the royal line, applies right away to us. Now we have come now in chapter 4 to the fifth vision, and we have seen in the outline at the beginning, there are eight visions, that's the first part of the book, and then we have the second part speaking about oracles, first about uh, fasting, and then visions, in co or oracles in connection with the first coming of the Lord, and oracles in connection with the coming again of the Lord. But that we'll have to wait for later, Lord willing. 
So what do we see in verse 1? The angel that talked with me came again and waked me. That is something we did not notice yet here in this book. So that introduces a very special portion. And I think this has a, a practical lesson for us too. This waking up would speak about a spiritual revival, a reviving. And this is what was needed in those days, a spiritual reviving. And we have seen already earlier that this book is given as uh, by way of encouragement to encourage the people to build. And so this book would be an encouragement for us today, also for our young people, as we see in this chapter uh, especially. And the Lord would like to wake us up to revive us. And we have a song, Revive Thy Work, O Lord. This is what is needed. We think of uh, other examples like Daniel, when he had a, saw a vision, he was also fallen asleep and he was waked up. Think of Jeremiah, when he saw a vision, he woke up. And so these, this is a suggestion of a special work of God towards reviving his people. And I was reminded of Peter and the disciples on the mountain, when the Lord was there, the Mount of Transfiguration, they, fall, they had fallen asleep. They needed to be waked up. And how practical this is, how often we fall asleep spiritually, and we need to be wakened out of our sleep, to be alert, spiritual alert. When we come to verse 2, it says there, What seest thou? So the angel wants to help him. Something similar we see with Jeremiah. He was a young man, and he saw a vision, and the Lord asked that question in Jeremiah 1. And I encourage you to read Jeremiah 1. It's a very encouraging chapter, where we see how the Lord introduces a young man into his thoughts. And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold. So he answers the question, he describes now what he saw. So that is the first thing that we need to understand, what he was actually seeing. And then what he is seeing is then explained in the course of the chapter. So what did he see? A lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it. And it's seven lamps. The lampstand had seven lamps, and the seven lamps were connected with pipe that went to the lamp, and later on we see that the pipes came from the branch, the branches. And so they were connected, verse 3, with the two olive trees beside it. It's a complicated situation to picture in our minds, but try to do that. And it says then that the lampstand was in the middle. So you had two olive trees, one at the right side, one at the left side. This reminds me of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus we find so many times in the midst. And the lampstand is really an excellent type of the Lord Jesus. He is the true lampstand. He could say in John 8, I am the light of the world. So if you think of the lampstand, you think first of all of the Lord Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. In John's Gospel, the Lord says also to the disciples, you are the light of the world. And he says in Matthew 5 also, in connection with the kingdom of heaven. And so now we may apply this to the people of God, or to disciples today, who are in the kingdom of God, and who represent the Lord Jesus. In 1 John 2 we read, you are, I say this in my own words, as he is. So what the Lord Jesus is, he is the light of the world, we represent him now in this world. The lampstand gives light. The lampstand is also a testimony. These two things go together also in this chapter. We are living in a dark world. When you study the Temple of Ezekiel, as, as far as I remember, you don't find a lampstand in the Temple of Ezekiel. Why not? Because in the millennium, the sun of righteousness will shine. There will not be need, not be need of a lampstand. But now we are living in a dark world. There is where the lampstand was needed. And so it was when the Lord came, he was the true lampstand. But now we may function as lampstand. That's a special privilege for us, for believers today, who are really in tune with the Lord Jesus. That's the condition, to be in tune with him. Are we in tune with him? Are we really in close communion with him? We see this very clearly in this picture. And then it also speaks of the future. The future remnant will function as a lampstand. And the two... Uh, witnesses in Revelation 11, if you can read Revelation 11 at home, you see a clear parallel with the lampstand here. There are also differences, but there are also a parallel. Now, in connection with this communion where I was talking about, this communion can only uh, really function as it should if there are no hindrances. What do I mean? We find here the lamps that are connected with the pipes, the pipes are connected with the olive trees or the olive branch, and so there is a continuous flow of this oil, and also called gold at the end of the chapter. We'll come back to that. So it's called gold and it's called oil. But there is a continuous flow. And this is what is needed to maintain 
a testimony for God on this world, on this earth, a continuous flow of communication and with the resources that are in God is needed. The resources are not in us. We see later uh, that it was the day of small things. We see also in verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. You see the link with the oil? The oil, the olive oil, also always speaks of the Holy Spirit in the Scripture. So, we'll get back to that. But now my point is, there is a continuous flow. So, if we summarize verses 2 and 3, we see that the lampstand of gold, it is in connection with God's glory. Everything here is completely according to God's holy standards. It's not like the seven candles, candle, uh, the lampstands or candlesticks in Revelation 2 and 3. There is a parallel also. But there the emphasis is on responsibility. And what do we see? Failure. Here is no failure. Here the, you see the things from God's perspective. So in a day where there is a little reviving, where the overall picture is very dark, there is a work of God. And that is the picture you find here. And so everything here is sustained by God himself and maintained for his own glory. As to the seven pipes, there are different interpretations. Some uh, think that uh, as the note in the Darby version also gives that seven pipes were for each land, so that is then a that underlines the fullness of the resources, the abundance of the provisions, and also there is an interpretation that says there were uh, fourteen pipes, so that means then two pipes for every uh, land. So that underlines then the idea of a testimony. If you go to the New Testament, for example, Philippians two says that we are now shining as lamps, as lights in a dark world. Uh, cannot quote it uh, exactly as uh, Paul says it there, but it is a great challenge that we should shine as light in 2 verse 15, that we should be harmless and simple, irreproachable children of God in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation among whom ye appear as lights in the world, holding forth the word of light. So here is an example where we see how we should shine in this world, shine as lights. It's the same picture we have here. In this chapter, we see great emphasis on the Spirit of God, but we see also two times a reference to the Word of God. And I want to emphasize this, that the Word of God always goes together with the Spirit of God. And the Word of God goes together with light or testimony. You cannot separate that. As we've seen in Philippians 2, light and holding forth the Word goes together. And this is important for us today also. If we want to shine as light and testimony for the Lord, it can only be if... His word is a light for our uh, feet and, a, and a, a lamp onto our path. So it is important that the word of God functions this way, and otherwise it won't work. So you see the flow of the resources, and God wants this to be unhindered. It's also a picture that shows the dependence. The, lamp, the lamps cannot shine unless there is the provision from the olive tree, unless... And also, the condition is that the pipes are not blocked. And so there, right away, we have a very practical lesson for us today. Are we functioning as pipes? Are we pleased to be a channel that God can use just to use, to forward something to somebody else? Can we function as a channel, or are we blocked? It's a very practical question. Not everyone can shine as a lamp like Zerubbabel, but we can function as pipes. And that is indispensable. Study 1 Corinthians 12, you see the members of the body there, that all the members are important, and even the members that are not seen so much, not on the foreground, they are indispensable. And that is here the picture of the pipes. The pipes are indispensable. If the pipes wouldn't be there, the whole thing would not work. So are we willing to be pipes? Are we willing to be a lamp? Of course, we, we should be willing to be a lamp, not asking any attention for ourselves, but just to shine forth the word of God. Shine, represent the Lord Jesus. So all depends really on the power of God. But it is connected with our responsibility to be available, to be in tune. So that is why there are many practical lessons. Then we come to verse 4. And I answered and spoke to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Here we have the spirit of inquiry. It's like the disciples when they came to the Lord on the Mount all of it, and they came with some questions, and that's very important. The Lord wants us to come with questions. Questions make you grow. Questions help to understand. So here's the spirit of inquiry, like with Jeremiah, and here with Zechariah, and we have seen that already a couple of times. And it's very important for us in general also that we have the spirit of inquiry to see more of God's thoughts, to enter into God's thoughts. We are living in a day that people are not really interested. They go through the motions. But there is not the spirit of inquiry. 
this is what is so encouraging to see even this young man here in verse 5 uh, the angel the way he says it knowest thou not what these are would almost look like that he was supposed to know it sometimes we ask questions and if we would think a little bit we could find the answer in the scripture but anyway it is good that he asked these questions if perhaps i can bring in this thought right now here about the unction we find in first john 2 that we have the unction and we will get back to that also in the end of chapter 4 because it speaks about the sons of oil there and first john 2 says that we have the unction of the holy one and we know all things so these are these provisions that god has given to help us we have the unction from the holy one and you know all things and the same unction teaches you as to all things so two things we have the unction first john 2 verse 20 and it teaches us as to all things now there are many people who make wrong conclusions they say so you don't need to read any books you can just rely and so they would even despise help from ministry or that is not I think the intention, the intention is to show that the resources are there. But if the Lord wants to use a brother to teach us, and in dependence on the Lord, we better take that opportunity and appreciate that. That is part of this uh, teaching as we have in 1 John 2. And so that is in the context of knowest thou not what these are. We are supposed to know, we have the unction, but then still there is a provision to be taught and to grow in the knowledge of the truth. In uh, 1 Corinthians 1, we see that, no, 2 Corinthians 1, we see that we have the unction, that we are anointed. And there you see that it is in view of public ministry. So, because of this, we have the provision, but we have to enter into this resource. That I think we can learn from Zechariah. The provisions are there, but we, but we need to uh, do an effort to enter into God's thoughts. But it is in view of course, this unction also is in view of public testimony. That's the whole context of the chapter. We will see more of this in the next verses. So we only go to verse 6 now. He answered and spoken to me, saying, This is the word of Jehovah. We have seen in the book of Haggai that the word and the spirit go together. Here we have another example. The word in verse 6, the spirit in the end of verse 6. The word again in verse 8. And this whole chapter speaks about the oil type of the Holy Spirit so you see it goes together the Word of God and the Holy Spirit always go together the second point I want to say about verse 6 is there have uh, the royal line Zerubbabel He's, the word is addressed to Zerubbabel you represent the royal line and keep again in mind the whole context we have seen the last time in chapter 3 Joshua the high priest and you remember in chapter 6 verse 13 we see that both come together in verse 13 even he shall build the temple both come together in the branch and please keep this in mind because because we'll come back to the branch the branch here is a type of the Lord Jesus the Messiah the anointed one by the way and it says in verse 13 even he shall build the temple of Jehovah and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne so here you have now the prophetic picture it leads to the prophetic fulfillment in the millennium but today the lord jesus is also the branch and today he is now glorified and so you may apply it to uh, the lord in the glory and he is priest and king you find it in hebrew 7 for example he is the true melchizedek king priest on the throne wonderful and that is where we then also come into the picture but i wanted just to remind you of the connection that what was in two types uh, Zerubbabel on the one hand the royal line Joshua, Joshua on the other hand the priestly line is connected in the Lord Jesus and I repeat both represent of course the believers today the royal line and the priestly line now what does the angel add to that in verse 6 not by might nor by power might is the might of an army second chronicle 32 we had yesterday evening you see the uh, siege of Sennacherib he wanted to besiege Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah and he had taken many many cities in judah that was might nor but power you can think of goliath the strong uh, giant but this is not the way god works in days of uh, ruin god says but by my spirit and this is a challenge for us also today <clears throat> we want a big army or we want a giant today also but god says no by my spirit says jehovah of hosts jehovah of hosts means he is in charge he has an army host really it means an army god is the god 
who has an army and he is in charge. And now we may take our place in his army. Of course, this also refers to the heavenly armies, but we may apply it to us literally. We are in God's army, in the Lord's army, that you have in Numbers, that you have also in the New Testament, but are we really subject to to his guidance. The spirit here, of course, refers, is connected with the oil, what we have seen in this chapter. So keep that in mind. When the spirit is mentioned, of course, that goes back then to the illustration. It's like an object lesson. The verses 2 and 3, it's like an object lesson to teach us spiritual realities about the lampstand, about the oil, and so on. Then we come to verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain? What's the great mountain? Literally here, I think it refers to the Persian emperor. And the Jews, <clears throat> they had stopped building, rebuilding the temple and under pressure. And they were afraid, but they were encouraged to start rebuilding, even before they had the confirmation from the Persian emperor. You see that in Ezra. So, when the Lord is at work, no one can stop him. That's the point. Not The greatest world's power can stop God. That is here the lesson of verse 7. Uh, we find also in uh, Isaiah 40 that uh, the prophet says, what is high and elevated will be made low. God is in charge. And uh, the Lord says, if you would have a face of a, as of a mustard seed, say to this mountain and will be taken away and thrown into the sea. And I think there, in the context, the Lord refers to the system of, the religious system of Judaism that rejected him at that time and it would be removed. But faith would be needed. And faith, of course, is needed in every dispensation. And so we are living also in the day of faith in a very special way. Do we have faith in God? That God can do this. O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, thou dost become a plain. This is faith. And then he shall bring forth the headstone. This was in view of something. It was in view of the completion of the temple. The temple, the foundation had been laid with shoutings, as there are three. Then it had stopped. But this verse says, He shall bring forth the headstone with shoutings. So there would be a completion. And that's in the next verses we see that. But before we get to the next verses, I want to talk a little bit with you about the stone. Um, <clears throat> we find already in Genesis that the, that the Lord is compared with a stone. A stone of protection. A stone of help. We find many references to the thought of refuse connected with the stone. But there are a couple of verses that I wanted to bring before your attention. The first verse is very well known in Psalm 118, where it refers to the Lord very clearly. In verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. And we'll get back to that, but I just wanted to read the verses together and then compare them. In Isaiah 26, verse no, 28. Isaiah 28, verse 16, Behold, I lay for foundation in Zion a stone, a tried stone, it should be a testing stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that trusts shall not make haste. These are important verses. If you read here Isaiah 28 first, the stone, you can find, as I mentioned earlier, Genesis already, many other places. Culture and architecture. Did you know that, Joseph? There's a connection between agriculture and architecture. Amazing. But that's many times in the scriptures the case. But in Isaiah 28, we find here the testing stone. That's important because the stone tests all the other stones. If today, in man's responsibility, 1 Corinthians 3, stones are added, it has to be according to the testing stone. And the testing stone is also the foundation and it is the cornerstone here, a precious cornerstone. So you find that the cornerstone uh, keeps the whole building together. But now, <clears throat> what we find in uh, Psalm 118, we have read, the builders have rejected that stone. But that stone is needed to lay the foundation. The stone is needed to keep the whole building together as the two cornerstones. And the true stone, and of course now we understand it's a picture of the Lord Jesus, is also the headstone or the top stone. We find that in First Tim uh, Timothy 3, for example, in connection with the house of God, we see the house of God and the assembly is the house of God and is the pillar of the truth. But the assembly can only keep the truth. It's not the truth itself. The Lord is everything. He is the truth connected with the house of God, but he is also the foundation. He is also the cornerstone. He is Ephesians 2, we find the cornerstone. And here we find also the top stone. The stone that, again, will test because if the top stone is broad, 
and put there, and the building is not in order, what will happen? It will come down. So, this is a very important thought. The top stone will be brought with shoutings, and then it will be shown that everything is in order, from the foundation to the top. This is God's idea. His house needs to be in order. And are we, like Zerubbabel, exercised about that? And then it says, grace, grace unto it. No attention asked for Zerubbabel, no attention asked for the people, all attention is asked for the stone. In Acts 4, they speak about the stone. And so many places you could look up First Peter, we are living stones, together with the living stone. So whether you look at the foundation, we are connected with him. Whether you look at him as the corner, we are connected with him. Whether you look at him as the top stone, we are connected with him. That's our privilege. But we have the responsibility to make sure that the house is in order, according to God's standards. So what we see here, on the one hand, God's standards, but at the same time we see God's power at work. In verse 6 we have seen it. This is made through the power of God. And grace, that's all grace. Grace is written on that stone. It's nothing that really depends on man, although man is responsible. It's all grace. So if we can do something for the Lord and would have result, we can only say it's because of grace. We cannot boast in ourselves. Never. Now, I like to link this with verse 8. The word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel, so here's a pro- uh, promise now, that fit in with the earlier verses. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation, that is Ezra 3, Haggai 2 also, and his hands shall finish it. It's of this house, so it's really connected to the house of God. We talked about that. But his hands shall finish it. This is a beautiful thing. Philippians, we have referred to Philippians already in connection with the fact that we are lights or supposed to shine as light. Philippians 1 verse 6 speaks about God who has started a work in you, in us. And God will achieve, he will complete that work. That is a great comfort. God is at work, he will complete it. But there is also man's responsibility. And that's what we see now in Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel had laid the foundation. It is through God's power, it is with God's help. Yes. But he had laid the foundation. Are we laying the foundation? Then I apply it this way. Are we laying a sound foundation according to God's standard? His hand shall finish it. This is a wonderful promise. This is so encouraging. Uh, I noticed in studying a little bit, we find with Solomon also that he started and he completed. This is what is after God's heart. God starts something and he completes it. I like to start something, but to complete it is a different story. It takes not only energy, it takes perseverance, it takes faithfulness. All these qualities are needed. And the promise is, his hands shall finish it. And we have seen uh, last year in Corinthians with Haggai, in Ezra 6, it described how this was finished, and there was a the great dedication. Then at the end of verse 9, it says, Thou shalt know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me unto you. Hey, who is this me? Remember, I said at the beginning, every page of this book speaks of the Lord Jesus. And here, not only as the candle, uh, as the lampstand, or as the stone, here it speaks of him as the messenger. He is the messenger. He is Jehovah. He is also the angel of the Lord. He is the messenger. And he is the one who was sent by Jehovah of hosts. We have talked about Jehovah of hosts, who is in charge of a huge army. And here we see that the messenger took a humble place. The Lord Jesus himself took a humble place to be sent unto you. What a comfort this was for this tiny remnant there, that Jehovah himself would send the angel to them to help them. We find in Isaiah 63, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. He was with them. He was in the fiery furnace with Daniel's friends. He was in the thorn bush there. He was in, when Israel was in Egypt, in the furnace of labor and of bondage. He was right there. And so, Jehovah would send Jehovah of hosts, or Jehovah of hosts, excuse me, would send Jehovah, or the angel of the Lord, to be with this remnant to help them. This is very comforting. And so the Lord himself would associate himself with you and me if we are really available and want to do his will. He is there to help us and to accompany us. He's the great companion. We see that even in Laodicea. He's the great leader, and so many things we find about him. He is the messenger. Now this is done then according to God's thoughts, and his ways are higher than our ways. We have to keep that in mind. Isaiah 55 speaks about this, that his ways are higher than our ways. And so when God fulfills his plans, it's not according to man's ideas, with might and power, it's according to 
his ideas, according to his way. And beloved, is that not our problem, that so often we want to do things our way, and we don't really, we are not really open to the possibility that God may want it a different way. It has to be his way. And then we come to verse 10. Who has despised the day of small things? That verse can easily be used as an excuse. Uh, sometimes we use this verse, well, you know, what can we do? It's a day of small things. It's not to be used as an excuse. It is here given as an encouragement that despite of the fact that it was a day of small things, we should go on. We should not give up or should we should not see these things as being not important. The work that Zerubbabel and Joshua were involved in and the people there, this work was very important. But it looked for the outsiders and for some of them even, it looked despisable. There was a lack of faith. But they needed to see it from God's perspective. And so we today, not to boast in ourselves, that's the one extreme, or to say, well, it won't help anyway, that's the other side. No, to see the things from God's perspective. And may I say now a little parenthesis about small things. Did you know God uses small things? You may think, well, I'm just, I'm like a zero. Fine, I feel the same way. But God uses zeros, and he makes heroes out of them. Did you know that? God used Moses when he thought, well, what can I do? What's in your hand? There was a rod. He had led the sheep. God used small things. When you come to David, we're talking about young people. David was a young man. And what did he have in his hand? He had a sling. God said, go ahead. That was the power of God was in the sling. When you go to um, Samson, who was a big fellow, you would say, well, it's like a giant. Well, but God allowed him to use jawbone. This pies, we would say, it's impure. How can you use that as a Nazarite? But God was in it. God used it. And so God is the one who uses small things. We find in, uh, when we talked about judges uh, a month ago, we saw jail. God used a woman with a tent peg. We find in uh, Joshua 2, Rahab. She did not even belong to the people of God, but she had love of God love for God and for his people and God used a, a rope a small thing and so you can go on God uses small things there was a little boy he had only five little loaves and two fishes but God used them and he multiplied the Lord multiplied them so if we bring the little things we have and make them available to the Lord then he will do the rest but did you know that also the devil can use small things a little bit of leaven leavens the whole land the devil only lead, needs a little bit of leaven but of course, that is something that speaks of evil. So if there is something that we realize that is evil in my heart, I have to deal with it right away because otherwise the enemy will, go, will use it. So that is a negative example. But God uses small things. That is very encouraging in a day of small things. And when we think of the Lord Jesus, he took the lowest place and God used him, taking a small, a low place to show his greatness and to have the victory. Then in verse 10 it says, Yea, they shall rejoice. I like to link also the small things with Philadelphia. If you have time tonight or tomorrow, read Philipp, uh, Revelation 3 about Phil Philadelphia, and you see there little strength. That goes together with the small things. God gives each one of us little strength, but is it, are we available that he can use this little strength? Are we also faithful to keep his name and not to deny his name? And the other uh, qualification there is to keep his word. We're talking about his word. His word and the power of the Spirit of God go together with the little power that we have. But we need to be faithful then. What do we see in verse 10? Even though seven, that's a difficult uh, expression again. What does that mean? Even though seven shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. So, <clears throat> look here again. Zerubbabel is the builder. Again, an example, a type of Lord Jesus. He's the great builder. Matthew 16 speaks about him as the builder of the assembly. And so Zerubbabel is here also again a type of the Lord Jesus, the great builder. Today, you and me, we may build. But now what is that, what does that mean? The plummet in the hand. Things needed to be tested. The plummet speaks about a line with a little bit of lead at the end. And so with that line, everything is measured and, and seen whether it is straight. The architects know about that, right? But we all need to make sure that things are straight and not only designed straightly, but also put into practice straightly, according to God's standard. That is what Zerubbabel, uh, Zerubbabel's re um, responsibility is, to make sure that the building takes place the right way. 
not only sufficient to have a lot of energy to build, but it needs to be done in the right way. And he's a right builder and speaks of the Lord Jesus. But then, we have seen already the foundation stone, we have seen the cornerstone, the headstone, but what is the meaning of the seven? Uh, if you turn back to chapter 3, verse 9, what we had the last time, we saw already the stone, for behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. There it is, the priestly line. There is also a stone, stone before Joshua. And then we have seen there, upon one stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, says Jehovah of hosts. The seven eyes would speak of intelligence. God is marked by intelligence. A fullness of intelligence, number seven. Fullness, completeness of intelligence, insight. But I submit to you that now the seven eyes, as we have them in chapter 3, and also here now in chapter 4, verse 10, go together with these seven lamps that we are talking about. Lamps in testimony. Go also together with the fullness of the Holy Spirit that we have here. And the Holy Spirit we find in the book of Revelation, also in fullness, seven spirits. And there it goes together with what is characteristic for the Lord Jesus. His, the eyes are connected there again with the Spirit. So it's uh, a thought that comes back in the scriptures often. Intelligence, testimony, power of the Spirit goes together. So the seven here shall rejoice. Why? When they shall see the plummet. It's interesting to study the word rejoice. Paul says rejoice in the Lord, always. Do we rejoice? Here is an occasion to rejoice. We rejoice often about things that are not that important. And often we don't rejoice at all when we should rejoice. Uh, James says, rejoice when you fall in many fold temptations. In Luke 15, we find three examples of rejoicing. That's in connection with the gospel, of course. But here, the rejoicing is in connection with the house of God and things are accomplished now according to his standards. According to the eyes, that means the insight of the Lord. According to his desires and knowledge. And there we see the eyes go also, they run to and fro in the whole earth. We get back to that also. Here we are the, have the, the uh, royal line. It's in connection with God's rights. If you read the name Jehovah of Hosts, think immediately of the one who has all authority, but all rights. When the first time in the Bible this name is found, it was when Samuel was born. In a day, an age of departure, of ruin, there was one woman, Hannah. Her desire was that things would be changed around for the glory of God. And her son, Samuel, stood for the glory of God. He maintained God's right. This is what we find here in this little remnant here in Zerubbabel and in Joshua. They stood for God's right, for God's honor. For God's authority, the Jehovah of hosts. And we find, connect that now at the end. The Lord of all of the whole earth in verse 14. Adon speaks of his lordship. He is the ruler, the absolute ruler. Are we subject? Zerubbabel was. And in him the kingly line is represented. The royal line. The royal line can only function when there is this complete submission to God's authority. That is really the characteristic of the Lord Jesus. He was completely obedient. He is the true king. He is the true uh, Lord. And he functions in complete harmony with God. But bef before we get to verse 14, now we have verse 11. I answered and said unto him. So the prophet comes back now to his earlier question. What are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand on its left? So the olive trees speak of the fullness of resources that are available and that feed then the, la the lamps there. But then, notice in verse 12, it becomes even more complicated. What are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden tubes that empty the gold out of themselves? So, you find the two trees, verse 11, but then the two branches. And I've been thinking of that, and I come to this suggestion. We have seen already the Lord as the branch. Seen the Lord as the true priest, the true king. But in chapter 6, verse 12, he is also the branch. And now, what we find in the Lord Jesus is the true branch is represented in Zerubbabel and in uh, Joshua, the high priest. Because, I should have said that earlier, the two here, the two olive branches, it really, they really represent Zerubbabel and Joshua. And now we may apply it to us. Are we olive branches? Are we connected with the branch? The branch, the sprout, speaks of energy of life. Uh, we find a branch in connection with righteousness, in connection with servanthood. We find many features of the branch. I think we mentioned a few last time. But I think the two olive branches here, they 
represent the Lord Jesus as the sprout or the branch. At the same time, they are seen in the olive trees and the conclusion of the chapter, they are the sons of oil. So there are these different expressions that are used for Zerubbabel and for Joshua. And if you apply it then to us today, God wants us to function in connection with our link with the branch. He wants us to function as priests and kings. We have mentioned that already. And so the last expression there of the chapter is very interesting. The Lord, Jesus himself is the Messiah. That means the anointed one. And we mentioned already earlier that unction is in view of service. It's in view of functioning in a certain capacity that God has given. That was the case with the king. They were anointed. David even three times. He was anointed three times. First in rejection and then by the two tribes and then by the, by the whole people. And so it's in view of functioning. The high priest was functioned twice. Once with Aaron, with his sons and once alone. So it was in view of his functioning as high priest. And so if we apply it to us, we are brought into the function. God has anointed us because we are linked with the anointed, the true Messiah, the true anointed. And so God has anointed us as believers. That is here, of course, an exercise remnant, a remnant that really wants to enter into God's thought and maintain God's thought. Then we may appreciate that function and may function according to God's calling as priests and as kings in that line. Now, this verse the exp- uses the expression two sons of oil. So you could translate it very simply, the two anointed ones. That would be a free rendering. But the literal translation helps us, two sons of oil, to see also that it's a matter of sonship. Now, if you hear the expression sonship, you think again of the Lord Jesus. He's the two sons. Eternal son, his son in uh, his humanity. But sonship is connected with the believer today. We stand before God as sons. God finds his delight in those sons. It's not only that we are children of God, and that's a very great privilege, because as children of God we represent God, God is light, God is love, but as sons we are here for His delight. You can study this in many scriptures, we could not go, that would be a theme in itself. But if you think of Luke's Gospel, for example, we see their sonship in connection with sons of peace, sons of light, sons of resurrection, sons of the Most High, sons of light is here. So... Sonship is what we are for the delight of God. And what a joy this must have been for God to see this little tiny remnant there who took care of, the, and they took care of God's interest. Even in the day of small things, that humanly speaking, you'd say, well, it isn't, isn't worthwhile. But they were the delight of God. They were, and especially the two then here, the two sons of oil. So you understand this is a challenge for us to function according to these instructions on the priestly line, to function on the royal line. And I was thinking Psalm 133 that speaks of the oil that comes down from the head of Aaron, the high priest. You have sons of oil. They are connected with the anointed. And so, beloved, we are connected with the anointed, the true king, the true priest. And God wants to have us as testimony now here in this scene, as sons of the oil, anointed sons who are representing God here in this scene who stand here, look at the end of verse 14, that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. This expression is used uh, by Abram, the judge of the whole earth, or or of all the earth. The expression is used in the Psalms, the king of the whole earth, or all the earth. So, if we read Joshua, when the ark was uh, led over the Jordan River, we see that the water stood still in front of the ark, and that is then connected with the Lord of the whole earth. Uh, Solomon was seated of, on the throne of Jehovah and represented there the Lord of the whole earth. So today, we in our little situation, in our smallness, we may stand before the Lord of the whole earth. Of course, in the millennium, it will not be any problem to stand before the Lord of the whole earth. Every bow, Every knee will bow. But to, today, to stand before the Lord of the whole earth is not only a great privilege, as we find here, it's also a great responsibility. Are we really able to stand before the Lord of the whole earth? There will be 
a little remnant in Jerusalem in the days to come, in the Great Tribulation, in Revelation 11. And I, I referred to that already earlier, but it's really striking to see the power that God gives them, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. They represent God in a day, an age where God's authority is put to the ground, rejected, replaced by the authority of the Antichrist and the leader of the Roman Empire, the beast, they will stand before the Lord of the earth. And that's why I said this is a great challenge. We are living here before the Lord of the whole earth. Do you realize that? We are not standing here be before man, what man will think of us. We stand here before God, what God will think of us. That is what we have to realize all the time. We try to please man. That's the tendency we have. But are we really exercised to please the Lord of the whole earth? That is a great challenge. Now, <clears throat> I want to close with this thought about verse 12 and 13. I mentioned it already earlier. The flow. The flow needs to be unhindered. So this speaks about communion, speaks about dependence, and notice golden too. It speaks about God's glory. God's glory, the gold, is maintained. So we have divine resources. It's gold that comes out. And perhaps you know that the... Um, Oil, the olive oil, especially, of course, in golden vessels, looks like gold anyway. But it speaks of the resources that are in God, and that when God maintains this work here, it is according to his holy standards. God will never compromise, never. But here is the picture, not so much in connection with man's responsibility. Here we see again what God is doing. But we have noticed tonight also several times that there is great responsibility attached to it from our side. So may the Lord help us just, just function according to his plan. There's pipes connected with the olive tree, connected with the olive branch, and also represent him. Let us be golden tubes and function just to, in this concept, to promote God's interest in a day of small things. So we close with this.